faith. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe the three are one. We are the church and we stand as one. We believe in the Holy Bible. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in the resurrection, that Christ one day will return to earth. We believe in the blood of Jesus. We believe in eternal life. We believe in the blood that cleanses us from John the cry of Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come with a grateful heart this morning that we can assemble in this your presence. Amen. And we know this morning, Lord, the presence is not this place, but the people who've come together to worship. We would ask you this morning to look upon us with favor, forgive us of our sins, and we want to lift up and thank you for the marvelous gift of Jesus, who on a day very much like this, when he came and was get born into human flesh, to live a life tempted like as we and yet without sin, to give us a pattern of living and a teaching of truth that can bring us to you through him and the everlasting gift of salvation. Bless us now in these moments to prepare our hearts to receive your word today. And we'll be careful to give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, Merry Christmas Eve. How great is it on Christmas Eve to be in the house of the Lord? Uh, good news. We passed our Lottie Moon goal. I know as of this morning we have at least $676. Uh, over and a, above our $500 goal, we are going to keep the offering open through next Sunday. Next Sunday will be Lottie Moon Sunday. We will have some uh, some lessons and teachings about Lottie Moon. We will bring this uh, wonderful offering forward. We will bless it, and we will send it out across the world to do the good work of the Lord. So, thank you to everybody that participated in this wonderful, wonderful offering. Uh, we will not be having church services tonight so that people can uh, share time with their families or with their cat, as the case may be. Um, uh, but we are glad to see everybody here this morning. A wonderful, wonderful time of year to gather together and fellowship in the good name of the Lord. Uh, here in just a few minutes, we will be uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper, a wondrous, wondrous ceremony that we do here in the life of the church as believers. And uh, I think back to what this auditorium looked like this time last year or this time, especially two years ago. Uh, there's probably three times as many people here as there was a couple years ago, and that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Amen. Praise Jesus. And I hope that this time next year, we have even more people here celebrating the good word of the Lord in fellowship and communion together here in the life of our church. This has been a, a wonderful, wonderful year for our church. Uh, both financially, uh, attendance-wise, but more importantly, spiritually. This has been a wonderful year for our church. Uh, we have been blessed beyond words at the wonderful things that the Lord has uh, brought to this place this year. So we need to all be thankful for this. Uh, we celebrate Thanksgiving every year, but I have often believe that Christmas is really the time to be the most thankful because the greatest gift came at Christmas time. Amen. Uh, driving around town yesterday, I saw thousands and thousands of beautiful Christmas lights. I got home and I told my, my wife, I said, you know, the first Christmas there was only one light. Amen. And uh, 
it was the most important of all. Amen. To celebrate that this morning, am I forgetting anything? Uh, no, I think you've covered it Okay. All. We still have the roofing fund going, as everybody knows. Uh, we still have the insurance fund going, as everybody knows. I just wanted to focus on some of the blessings that has been brought upon us. I cannot hear you. Yeah, no evening services tonight. Uh, so uh, to celebrate this beautiful, wonderful Christmas Eve Sunday, let us all stand together. Let us turn to number 87 and sing joy to the world. Sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love. Maybe seating. Usually, about this time, I'm joking around. You're looking at me with this blank look on your face. Yeah, boy. Have you read the order of the bulletin? No. Well, may mayhap you should read the order of the bulletin this morning. Special music, Dina Wood. Oh, my word. He changed me. <laughs> and rearranged me. Yes, he did. Amen. He is. And I may be a strange in you. <laughs> Usually at this time, yes. I'm cutting some joke yes. or making some kind of quip. Yes. This morning, I'm not going to. Yeah, well, I don't be that way. I'm just going to say that... At this time, one of the blessings our church has been graced with this year is coming to sing Miss Dean. Amen. Amen. All glory to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yes. 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 The blessing is mine. Amen. I'll get you next week. No, you won't. <laughs> the blessing is mine. I tell you, I've never been as blessed as I've been since I've been here. Amen. I mean, God has blessed me, yes, multiple times. But this coming together of spirits is, has been tremendous to Gemini. Yes, ma'am. Tremendous. So all credit goes to God. Amen. This is a new song. I couldn't even find the music. I, I went to Nashville, I went to Arkansas, I went to Lubbock, I went everywhere on the internet to friends and called in friends. And nobody has music, nobody has sheet music, nobody has anything. But God gave it to me through a little radio station man out in Lubbock. And it came, a man sat down at his piano in his living room in Arkansas, and I sent him a YouTube thing from that was done years ago, and by ear, he played me a song. Wow. And he emailed it to me. And I said, thank you, God. And then Satan tried to get me where I couldn't.
would share with you what Christ gave to me. I would share with you what Christ gave to me. Hang on. It's a professional act. Brandon Key and Ollie are here. Get with them. Ollie, A W A. Ah, we. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Go ahead. We're working this act out. Uh -huh. We're working this act out. It's the best one down the back. Thousands of hours of practice put into this. Would never do anything right off the cuff. Uh, Dina, I must say, I think that's the most beautiful song I've heard you sing. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you, Douglas. God did that. Well, he did good. He did better than I was doing. We are blessed this morning, I want to point out, to have Brandon... His lovely wife, all we here today. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, we hope that the Lord has been blessing the two of you and uh, want you to know that we're honored to have you here today. And uh, please, please don't make it so long between visits because you are always welcome. Okay. Let us now for our offertory hymn stand together. Let's turn to number 91. prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come this morning again lifting up to you the gift of Jesus. How you and your creation, loving us so very much in all of our wondrous ways, and yet you determined that only the blood of Christ could free us from our sins. And you made this offering to us. We sing this morning about the day of his birth. Our hearts are opened up before you today that you might search them and reveal to us the needs of our life and that we might place all we have that's not in your favor under the blood of Jesus by faith. We ask you now to bless the time of giving, that we surrender not only of our material possessions, but of our lives in service to you and those round about us. And Lord, this morning, as Dean St. Dean saying a moment ago, if we could just tell others the story of how we came to know Jesus. Amen. Bless this time of giving and offering and before you today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 
It's all perspective, isn't it? <laughs> I'd like to have uh, Brother Wood and Brother Reed come by and we'll move the table out a little bit, prepare for a time of the Lord's Supper. I have some comments prior to us. Okay, that'll be fine. Leave yourself room to get through over there now. Oh, we definitely, yeah. I'll be right here. Okay. Louder? Yes. That about right? Yes. <laughs> I am away from the microphone, so I will try to talk a little bit louder for you. How you doing, Bob? You can just and, uh, yeah, there you go. Kind of let you kind of know what we're going to be doing. Thank you, Jim. One of the things I wanted to take time this, to do this morning is to explain why we do a Lord's Supper and what the Lord's Supper is intended to be for you and me and anyone else. And the thing that we want to do about that is to just come to understanding. First of all, let me say this morning that according to scripture, the unleavened bread we will take is representative of remembrance, in remembrance of the body given for us at Calvary. Again, Dina sang a moment ago of those arms that came from Calvary Rappus in, in the love of Christ today. And then the cup we will take represents the shedding of the blood of Jesus in remembrance. It's not a sacrament. It has no power other than for you to remember that Christ died for you. Amen. That his blood was shed to meet our debt before Almighty God because only with the shedding of blood is there any remission of sin. And so all of those people who had sacrificed animals back in the days prior before the birth of Jesus Christ, all their sins are paid for at Calvary. They weren't paid for when that lamb or that little turtle dove was, was sacrificed, but they pointed forward to the cross when Christ, the Son of God, would be sacrificed to pay for all of the sins of those who believed in Him long before His coming. And for us today, we go back to the cross. And since the days of the crucifixion of our Lord, His resurrection and ascension to heaven, we look forward for Him to come a second time. Yes, sir. To receive us unto Himself that where He is there, we may be also. And again, it's a service of my sins were paid at Calvary. I did them a long time after Calvary, but they were paid for at Calvary. Just like everyone in this audience today who trusts Christ as their Savior. Amen. I want to share with you first of all this morning in the book of Isaiah chapter 7, the 14th verse, where we find these words and the essence of the story is found in the words that we're going to be sharing with you here in just a moment. In this passage, that Isaiah the prophet writes at the inspiration of Almighty God, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. God's creator, God is the protector, God is the preserver, and God provides the salvation. Amen. And so God himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. That has never happened before, nor shall it ever happen again. And the Bible says here that uh, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, and that means God with us. This is about 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. A man asked me one time, he said, well, if God's going to do that, why didn't he do it right back here? Because God wasn't ready. Why did God wait 700 years? I can't answer that. 
but God did it when he was ready. Now, we have another portion of New Testament Scripture which says to us that when the fullness of time was fully come, that means when it was on God's timeline. We've been teaching a lot about timeline lately. We all have a timeline. You ought to sit down sometime and write out your timeline. You've got your birth date. You've got your age of accountability when you made a decision to trust Christ as Savior. And you've got all the events along that line on both sides of that experience to help you realize what God washed away when he cleansed your soul, Amen. when you trusted Christ as your Savior. So God's word says, and when the fullness of time was fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, wrapped in human flesh to walk among us. And the message this morning, we'll touch a little bit more on the experience of Jesus in that particular passage. And so the Bible teaches us that we need to realize that the sign was provided by God, came from God, was from God to us as part of the great love story. Amen. How much more could God love you than to sacrifice his son to save you from your sins really? and put you in eternal familyhood with him? The Bible says we are grafted into Jesus Christ by faith. We are born and brought into the family of God by our choice of Christ as Savior. And we're part of an eternal family that will spend eternity in heaven. Praise Jesus. And so when we take this bread in a moment and we take that and we bite it and we crush it and internalize it. And when we take likewise the cup, signifying that it's by the blood of Jesus, through the death of Jesus in the bread, through the blood of Jesus in the cup, both are going into our lives. And that's what happens when we trust Christ. Amen. And this is why we have communion service. It's a service of remembrance. So we don't forget what Christ has done for us. Now you might be sitting there saying, well, how could we ever forget what Christ has done for us? But I can tell you this morning, there are millions of people who've forgotten what Christ has done for them. There are millions who have backslid and, and left the work and have turned from service. And so this is an important time for us this morning to take a few moments to visually impress upon us the death of the body, the shedding of the blood, and the redemptive act of Christ that we are, should be so excited about this morning to be born again, to be going to heaven and not to hell, yeah. to be in right relationship instead of at odds against God. You know, when he spoke to old Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road, he said, it's hard for you to go against the pricks, go against the grain. You're not going in the right direction, Saul. I have a special work for you to do. And so God called him for that work. And so this morning we're going to have our men now come and, and pass the bread. And then we'll have them come and pass the cup. And then we will together consume those in remembrance of our sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Gentlemen can come, please. You can do it if you want that, but if you do it that way. Jesus said to the disciples on that first night at their last time to be together as a group and to be together to fellowship with him. He gave them bread and he said, take and eat. As we break the bread, we think of the battered body of Christ given for us. And likewise, after supper, the cup, he said, this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you.
I'm going to ask you now if you'll place your cup in the holders that are in on the pews. And two of our men will pick those up after the service. Okay? Thank you. As you are well aware, we normally have a Lord's Supper celebration of remembrance at the end of a service. But this time I wanted to do something different so we'd have an opportunity to focus on that as we go to Scripture this morning, remembering our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'd like you to take your Bibles, and you would have them with you, or a pre Bible in front of you. And open with us, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 22. Now, I'm often asked this question. You talk about lost and you talk about saved, and what's the difference? Well, the difference is Christ Amen. that you have to accept as your Lord and Savior. And Jesus spoke to the crowds of his day in Matthew 22 and 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, that means you're in error, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Really? So when people come to us and, and they ask us about salvation, or they ask us about the things of God or the work of the church or whatever, what does that tell us right off the bat? Well, they're in error because they don't know what the scripture says. Amen. And secondly, they don't know the power of God. A lost person does not know what power God could do in their lives. Think of your own experience when you trusted Christ as your Savior and the difference in your life today compared to what it used to be. Yes, sir. Okay? And so we need to think about that. Two errors are made by man in this, first, this verse. They don't know the Scripture and they don't know the, know the power of God. Down in verse 32, he said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. That's those who are living spiritually. It's not about whether you're at Cedar Lawn or someplace else this morning. It's about where you are with Christ. Amen. And so it's critical for us to be focused upon that. One of the things that Jesus talks about a great deal was the fact that these people did not have in their own awareness the knowledge that God loved them enough to send Christ to die for them. You know, you, you can love a person and send them a present. You can love a person and send them a letter. You can love a person and send them a good word. But to really love a person is to bring them into life everlasting. Amen. To share your faith and invite them to know Christ as you know him. I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 15 this morning, verses 8 and 9, the problems in our world today. This people, and he's talking about Christian people, this people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Salvation is a heart experience. It's a heart response. It's a heart acceptance. Now in verse 9, he tells us why we have so many problems in our world. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. 
Doctrine comes from the Word of God. It's God's statements of faith that we read every single Sunday morning that are the cornerstones of the foundation upon which we have built our life. I was thinking this week, which of those statements could we take away and have our foundation still be complete? The answer is none. Yes, sir. We have to believe in God the Father. We have to believe in God the Holy Spirit. We have to believe in Christ the Son. We believe the three are one. That's what the scripture teaches to us today. God functioning in three separate entities to get the job done within us heart in our hearts and lives. Yeah, we have to talk about and focus on the fact that those statements, as we read and share them each week, they're not vain repetition. They're a statement of this is where I stand with God, and this is where I stand on God's word. And this is why we're strong Christian people. Because God, these are the cornerstones, the building blocks. They're those deep pylons upon which we seek in the earth to build a great faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But our world doesn't do that. They don't worship Christ. They teach doctrines of men as commandments. And that's not what God's word is all about this morning. We'll find in Matthew 16, 4, if you will follow with me there. It said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Therefore, no sign shall be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Think about the sign of the prophet Jonah. What a wonderful time when God calls a man to deliver a message. And the man said, I don't want to do that. And the Bible said, I want you to go to Nineveh. But he didn't go to Nineveh. He went down and got on a ship going in the opposite direction. And God brought a storm about. And the sailors became fearful as the water was taken the, into the ship. And they were thinking about seeking. And, and then suddenly they asked each man, are you our problem? Are you our problem? Are you our problem? And Jonah said, I'm your problem. I don't think they took but one vote and they threw him overboard. And he was pretty happy about that, really. He was willing to die than do what God asked him to do. He was willing to die to drown in the sea. He didn't even fight them throwing him overboard. In his own mind, he was thinking, if I'm gone, this storm will take care of itself and it'll be over and these people will be saved. But God didn't wasn't through yet. He was swallowed by what they refer to as the great fish. It's actually a whale. And what's exciting about that, if you really look at that story and understand it, in the back of the throat of a whale, a whale is a plankton eater. Kind of like we'd say a cow is a grass eater. Okay. Cows don't eat other cows. You know, they eat grass. Whales strain the ocean for the nutrients. And in the back of the throat of the whale are gigantic tentacles. They look like reeds almost. That brings that water in, strains that. What he gets goes into the stomach through the reeds, and he blows the rest of it out the blowhole when he comes to the surface. He's also an air breather. That entire front chamber is filled with air. You say, well, if it's filled with air, how does the water get in there? Well, the water comes in, but it, it's, the air is kind of like a, have you ever been to one of these stores got an air curtain, you know? You ladies hate those, don't you? You go down and get your hair done, you walk in and it goes, Wee! you know? We guys just kind of do this and we don't really care. But what that does, it's a separation. And so we find Jonah's at the very back where these gigantic tentacles are. And he can breathe in the air there. When the whale takes it in, he doesn't take in all of it. He just takes it in a part of a mouth and he strains that. And so he can live in there. And he lives in there for three days. And finally... And I've often wondered how many days it would have been if he hadn't got around to getting business taken care of. But he finally says, my salvation is of the Lord. What's that saying? My only hope is the Lord. Amen. And when he said that, the Bible says the whale vomited him out upon the shore. He immediately runs to Nineveh. <laughs> and as I read my scripture without a bath, I can only imagine what he must have smelled like. But again, God is doing this. And so when he gets to the guard at the city, he said, I must see the king. And he just gets an immediate audience. That'd be kind of like me and you going to the White House and knocking on the, telling the guard at the front gate, I want to see Trump. And he said, well, do you have an appointment? I said, well, no. Well, sir, I don't see your name on the list. Well, I've got to see him anyway. You probably ain't going to get in. I'm sorry. 
You can say, I voted for him. Matter of fact, I liked it so much, I voted twice. But you still won't get in. But when God opens the door, what happens? He got an instant audience. He delivered the message God had laid upon his heart that God wanted to be preached. And the whole city, from the king to the lowliest stable boy, the word of God records, <coughs> completely repented in sackcloth and ashes. Now, I've never repented in sackcloth and ashes, have you? No. I've never put sackcloth where it scratched my body all over and I couldn't get comfortable and, and sit in the ashes and, and toss them up on my head. But you see, we've done something even better. We trusted Christ and had the blood of Jesus flow over us. His Holy Spirit seal our souls and set our feet upon a path that God is willing to bless uh, as we go forward for Him. Now take your Bible just a little bit and go back over to the book of Matthew. We're going to go back to chapter 10. Now a moment ago in our Lord's Supper, we took that little wafer, that little piece of bread, unleavened bread. We broke it with our teeth and internalized it. We swallowed it. And then we followed that with the cup representing the blood of Christ that has flowed over us and washed us and made us clean by faith. If you go in Matthew chapter 11, I want you to begin, if you would please, in verse 37. This is a powerfully moving verse if you'll read it with me. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. My dad's gone, my mom's gone, but I love them in, because of who they were. But I didn't love them as much as Jesus. He that loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And I love my son. He's sitting right back there. And he knows I love him. But I'm not supposed to love him more than Jesus. And I don't. Yes, sir. He that taketh not his cross. This is not God's cross. This is your own cross to bear. Amen. So we have to make a choice of taking up our own cross. I can put that another way. What are you going to do for Jesus? Amen. How are you going to serve him? How are you going to love him? How are you going to make him part of your life? And follow after me is not worthy of me. Now we're following after and we're not perfect. You know, Paul said, I pressed to the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul didn't know how close he could get to being like the Lord, but he was doing everything he could to be as close as he could be. He might have missed it a million miles. I don't know. But that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to want our life to, to emulate. That means to show forth the things of Christ. We should learn to try to love like Christ. And that's a tough one for us, isn't it? Because you've got to love everybody. And you've got to love them equally. <coughs> Secondly, you've got to see the need that every soul has. The people you like and the people you don't like. Because that's what Jesus did. And we have to be willing to surrender ourselves to the call of Christ. Which means I might have to do something I don't want to do. Like I might have to get early get up early on Sunday morning to come and worship him when I'd rather sleep till noon and maybe read the paper and put my feet up in the, on the ottoman. He then says in verse 39, he that findeth his life shall lose it. When you really discover what life truly is, it's a life lived in the faith of Jesus Christ. And you surrender yourself to him. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Until you know Jesus, you don't really know what life's all about. Amen. Amen. And so many people don't realize that. The change that happens in your life once you trust Christ as your Savior and determine that, wait a minute, it's about the hereafter, it's not about the here. You see? The Bible said, set your effects on things above and not on things of earth. Don't fall in love with this place because this place ain't going to last. We want to fall in love with that which endures for all of eternity. Now, he gives us a little pattern of service down here in verse 42 of the 10th chapter of Matthew. Who shall, shall give, whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say he shall not in no wise lose his reward. He says, if you meet the need of a thirsty person with a little cup of water, you won't lose a reward as a believer. Wonder what kind of rewards you would get if you to bring to them the cup of salvation Amen. by sharing with them about Jesus Christ. Yes, 
and being able to lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Now, he's talking to Christian people here. And I will give you rest. As a Christian, sometimes do you get tired? Do you feel like your burdens are greater than you can bear? Is your prayer list longer than you can remember without writing it down? <laughs> that happens sometimes. We forget how many people are depending upon us for prayer. Do you realize this morning that almost everybody in this room today, I'm sure, has family members that are not believers and how much they depend on you in prayer. They're depending on you to lift them up. They may not tell you that, but that's what they're thinking and they're hoping. They may not understand what you share with them about Jesus Christ, but we can pray for clarity that God would send someone with the message that they would receive. They may not receive it from me. They might not receive it from you, you see? But it can be received. And so we have to pray about that. Then he says, I will give you rest. That's spiritual rest. You might get up refreshed spiritually in the bar and be so tired you can't hardly move from chair to chair. But you've gotten what God wanted you to have. Amen. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now the yoke Jesus is talking about is the desire to know more about the master. That's why on Sunday evening and Wednesday night we teach the timeline of Christ right now. Uh, and we're teaching what happened to Jesus in those days between the, the birth and the time in the temple when he begins to answer questions and then later when he begins ministry and then as he finishes ministry and as he will go to the cross and to the grave and the resurrection and the ascension and the promise to come again. All of that's a beautiful timeline of Christ. Jesus speaks of himself. He said, I am meek and lowly in heart. And let me tell you something about the word meek. Meek does not mean sissy. Meek means power under control. Amen. Now think about that. Think for a moment how that, would, how that applies to Jesus Christ. Power under control. When they took him in the garden, the Bible said as he spoke, he knocked them, the voices, put them back flat on the ground. What could he have also done? He could have killed every one of them. Right. He could have done them like he did the unclean spirits because they were actually unclean spirits at the time. He could have cast them into a bunch of swine. He could have turned them into stone if he wanted to. He could turn them into salt if he wanted to. Yes, sir. He could do whatever he wanted to do. You betcha. But in meekness, power under control, he just simply repelled them back upon the ground. And so he says, I'm meek and I'm lowly in heart. He's a humble he never exalt himself above anybody. Not a time in Scripture. And you shall find rest unto your souls. It has nothing to do about your body. Okay? Rest unto your souls. If I'm going to have rest, I want it to be in my spirit. I don't necessarily need it to be in my body. Hours of sleep can refresh my body, but hours of sleep do nothing for my soul. Yes, sir. Only the power of Jesus. Amen. And he says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. We need to think about that. Does God put more on you than you can handle? Nope, not according to Scripture. According to Scripture, He never allows you to be tempted more than you can be able to say no if you want to. Now think about that. We have to want to say no. As a Christian, temptation is not automatically defeated as it comes into your presence. Amen. Now, I want to take you to Matthew chapter 4. And beginning in verse 1, I was asked this question not many months ago by a young man. I've been trying to get him interested in church, but I haven't been successful at the moment, but I'm working on him. And he said, I was in the, on the car radio the other day, and I heard a man talking, preaching, and he said, I went to turn it off, and then he started talking about the temptations of Jesus. And he said, I, I don't understand about the temptations of Jesus. And I said, it's real simple. Bible said he was led up to the spirit of the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Do y'all realize when you woke up this morning, you were led in the spirit to be tempted by the devil? You didn't have to go to the wilderness, did you? You just stay right there where you were. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. 
He's done that to me lots of times and you lots of times. And the answer of God was, Jesus, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. The most precious thing you can have is the word of God. It's more precious than food and Amen. water and all of that. Amen. And then he takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple and, and sets him down there. And he said, if you be the son of God, cast yourself down. What else does he say? The scripture says, he, God, will give his angels charge concerning you. In their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone. He said, I know what the scripture says. Let's find out if it works. But Jesus said, listen, you're not supposed to tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. You can't make deals with God. Now, I know people have been trying that for years. You know, you cannot make a deal with God. You cannot say, God... I'll start paying all my tithes and offerings if you'll just let me win the lottery. <laughs> save your time. Save God's ear. Or if you'll do, I'll do this, Lord, if you'll do this. No, he's already done his. Amen. He's already sent Christ to die for our sins. He's through. That portion is over. Amen. So don't try to make a deal. Then the devil appealed to the one portion that is, he was very experienced with this one. The devil takes him up to an exceeding high mountain and shows him the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said to him, all these things I will give thee if you'll fall down and worship me. The reason Satan was cast out of heaven was he was so beautiful he fell in love with himself. Amen. And he was the anointed cherub, the scripture says, more beautiful than any of the angels of God. Mm -hmm. But he made a mistake of falling in love with his own pride. And the pride caused him to rise up against God as it does even mankind today. Stupid. But lots of people have said to me, I'm not going to become a Christian because I want to run my own life. And they knew enough about it that God does the running if you'll just let him. And so they didn't want to turn loose of the things that they loved. So I'm going to turn down heaven and I'm going to gain hell, but I get to do my own way thing while I'm here. Well, think about something. If life is a speck, in eternity. Mm -hmm. And heaven is for all time. That's the worst deal you could ever make. Mm -hmm. The worst deal you could ever make. And so he says, bow down and worship me. And he said, I'll give you the glory of all this kingdom. Now think about the glories of the world that people sell out for today. How about fame? How about fortune? How about pride? How about things? How about things? You know, I never thought I'd see a time in, a, in the city of Sherman, and I've been a broker for 50 plus years, that people buy multi-million dollar houses. And I'm still figuring out, what do they do that they can pay for them, you know? <laughs> it takes a lot of money to pay a $5 million house off. You can put that on 30 years and you'll still burn your calculator up, yep. you know? But they do it. Uh, men pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for automobiles. And you say, what kind of job have these folks got? Well, they got good ones. <laughs> but I think if I paid four or five million for a car, I'd be pretty, I don't think I'd want to drive it. I'd be afraid somebody'd scratch it. You know? I remember reading when the Veyron first came out a few years ago, a man had a bad flat. He blew a tire out. And the tire and the wheel, it bit the wheel and the tire and the wheel cost $28,000 to replace. Yeah. And I thought, dude, they sell tires at Walmart. <laughs> but they probably don't sell the wheel that goes on it. They don't sell that kind of tire either. But, you know, there we go. Now, look what the, in the 10th verse here. Then said Jesus to him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Amen. That's what we need to focus on this morning. Coming together to know that. Now there's some special provisions that God has made for us in these passages. And that is that God wants to share with us some of the great blessings of life. I want you to go to the book of Matthew uh, chapter 28. We'll close out here in about three or four minutes. This is where the women come to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. They didn't have time when they took him down to the cross because the sun was setting and the Jewish day was over in which they could do no work. 
And the end of the Sabbath, it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the sepulcher, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. For fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Now the keepers were the guards that were post, posted on each side of the door by the Roman government. And the angel said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Come see the place where the Lord lay. I want to give you some reassurance. Come in here and look. He's not in here. Come look. Come check on it. Check it out. He's not here. Now go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. Behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there you shall see him as I have told you. They departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring the disciples' word. Their fear was because of the angelic messengers. The great joy was Christ was alive. As they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus to them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. And that's what they did. The Bible says in verse 11 and 12, when they were going, behold, some of the watch came to the city and showed the chief priest all the things that were done. They were assembled with elders that taken counsel and gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, His disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. Roman law says you're going to die if you go to sleep at watch. But they said, Tell this lie, we'll pay you, and nobody will hurt you. If this come to the government's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. We'll keep you safe. They took the money and did as they were taught, saying this is commonly reported of the Jews even unto this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Their hearts said yes, their heads said no. You realize that's where men and women are today? Your heart may want to say yes, but if you let your head say no, you're going to miss heaven. So many times people say how can it be this simple? What else do I have to do? The Bible says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. We're not required to do anything else. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to join a church. You don't have to give any money. You don't have to do any works. None of the things we commonly associate with being a Christian. You don't have to do any of that. What did the thief on the cross say to him? Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He says, what? Today you'll be with me in paradise. The next thing that man's going to know, like you and I, well, we're going to be with Jesus. The resurrection will have taken place. The rapture of the church will have taken place. And we'll join our Savior. Then Jesus spoke to them and said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. That's the statement of the situation of the Lord Jesus. Go you therefore and teach all nations. What? that all power is given unto Jesus in heaven and earth. That's your message. Baptize, that be the believers, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. There's a little phraseology about Christianity that God wants more than anything in your life, and that's pass it on. Tell someone else. Right on. And we can tell someone else audibly. We can tell someone else by the way we live, we can tell somebody else by the way we serve. We can tell somebody else by the lifestyle that we accept in our lives about Jesus. Yes, sir. And whatsoever I've commanded you, lo, I'm with you always. Now, there's no S on that. What's that mean? That means all the time. You know what I love about prayer? I never get a busy signal. <laughs> I never get put on hold. I like that. He's always there. He said, I'm with you always, all the time, even to the end of the world. And he says, oh, he says, amen, which means what? So be it. It doesn't get any better than that, does it? And so we discover this morning, I hope the Lord's Supper this morning has had a meaningful impact upon you to realize that it's just a service of remembrance. It's to help us. If I ask you to read your Bible every day, I'd be trying to bring into a service of remembrance 
so you can remember day after day the good, great things that God is doing in your life and the things God is doing for you and the blessing it is to know Him as Lord and Savior. I've been thinking a lot this week about the fact that, you know, millions of people come and sit in the church on this day, but they did not come to worship. They did not come to reverence. They came because they thought it was the thing they traditionally needed to do. But it's not that at all. If you don't love him, and you didn't come to worship him, you didn't come to praise and lift him up, if you're not doing that when you're here, then you haven't done what you're supposed to do when you get here. Yes, sir. And to let God's Spirit speak to our hearts about the needs of our life and present Christ as the answer. And that's what we do today. In a moment, we're going to have the pianist come and we're going to, to sing a song of decision. And our decision today is that we're going to love Jesus and serve Jesus and uplift Jesus and share Jesus coming forth in this coming year as we go forward to the end of these days. Let's stand together. What number is our song, dear? 300. 300 in the hymnal. Traditionally, we uh, come to the end of the service. I'm going to have a time of prayer. And then we're going to sing, Bless Me, the Tie That Binds, as opposed to our Thank You, Lord song. Almighty God, we're grateful today that we can lift up Jesus. We thank you for this most marvelous gift of his dedication to your will above all else in his earthly journey. To give the life that he had to purchase such as we. And we're so grateful today the power of the blood of Jesus to cleanse our sins and his power to set our feet upon the right path and his Holy Spirit to seal our souls and guide us and direct us daily. What a blessing and what a gift. We ask you now to look upon us with favor and forgive us of our sins in Jesus' name and help us this week to let someone see Christ in our life in one of the many ways of which we discussed earlier in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. everybody.